So welcome to uh, chapter six and part two um, of Mora Nebuchim. And uh, we last week, just to really give you a reminder, <coughs> we um, the Ramam described how the the spheres, right? Are, are and he was giving us remember I, I'm emphasizing this for a very good reason he was he explained that the spheres that that make up the um, the uh, the celestial uh, world the the, the 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 astronomical understanding according to Aristotle and and those that followed Aristotle so each sphere was made of some sort of substance each one moves in a circular manner and each one is being moved by an intelligence by by something that had what he calling it an intelligence or some sort of a, a consciousness, right? Remember that's Aristotle's idea, not the Ramam, and that's a scientific understanding. It's the way they understood in those days a force. So just as in their mind, when a human being thinks I'm going to walk forward, and then he or she walks forward, right? That that constitutes the the mind making a movement happen then there must also be some sort of a mind making each sphere happen. And then above the final sphere is, is the celestial, is, is God's sphere, so to speak. And God is the one that's making the, the whole thing happen, right? He's making the, the, the outermost one move, which makes the next one move, and so on and so forth, until all that motion makes everything that happens on this world, okay? So this is um, what we studied uh, last time, all right? And then Ramam showed us some proofs, some, he applied these ideas to verses, mostly all the verses that talk about how the heavens proclaim the glory of God and so on, that what this means is they're actually proclaiming the glory of God because these forces that make the, the world go around um, uh, or make the universe go around for that matter are, 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 are proclaiming the greatness of God by their motions and their movements, etc. Fine. Now, um, before I, I, I do today, I want to I want to go a, a slightly off topic, but I promised you last time. I don't know if I promised, but I suggested that I might do this. It's a little bit of a treat. So I, I mentioned the, this guy, a book that I've been recently reading, a guy named Kenneth Seeskin, S-E-E-S-K-I-N. He wrote several books on and and he um, he's a philosopher himself. Uh, he teaches philosophy at Northwestern University in Chicago. And he writes a lot about my uh, uh, Rambam. Um, and uh, and he wrote one book I'm reading from now is called Thinking About the Torah. This is the book, Thinking About the Torah. And he um, he also writes a, a book on Tanakh, Thinking About the Prophets, um, and a couple other books of his that I have that I'm in the middle of reading. He has one, uh, Guide for Today's Perplexed, which is like a, a an intro, and, and not an intro, it's really like a summary of the main ideas of the guide for, of Rambam's Mor Nebuchim. I highly recommend that book um, if you want to. And, and it's written in such an understandable and such a beautiful style that it makes these lofty ideas just so relevant and so real. I'm going to give you an example. One of the most difficult and most challenging parsha in the Torah is the parsha of the Akedah. And, and to be on, I mean, thinking think of the Akedah at Yitzchak, right? And there's a lot of things in that story that 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 are difficult, that are difficult to understand, difficult to wrap our heads around. And the most difficult is 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 the command, the initial command by God to Avram Avinu to sacrifice his son, and Avram's willingness to do so. You know, uh, we understand it on a, on the on its simplest level that, that you know that Avram Avinu was so devoted to doing God's will that he even sacrificed his son, and then in the end. God says, that's not what I really want. But there's, there's a million questions about it. And I, without going through all the questions, he writes, uh, you know, he writes a whole chapter bringing all kinds of philosophers. And uh, he goes through how Chazal and Rashi and Ramban. And then he talks about Kant and Kierkegaard and how they analyze the story. And then at the end, he says, it, it starts uh, uh, in his book. And I'm going to read to you in his words, not in mine. The headline is Maimonides to the rescue with a question mark. And um, and he's going to use Maimonides and some of the ideas that you and I discussed to analyze this parsha and come up with what I think is a stunningly beautiful understanding of Akedah Yitzchak. And for that, it's 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 so worthwhile. So I'm going to read it to you in his words. Although squarely in the rationalist tradition, 
Maimonides interpreted the story in, quite, in a way quite different from that of Kant or Kierkegaard. Whatever their differences, Kant and Kierkegaard both read the story literally. God issues a command, Abraham does his best to obey it, and at the last second, God changes his mind. Time and again, Maimonides warns that literal interpretation of Bible stories is ill-advised and often leads to error or confusion. His normal strategy is to approach such stories as parables, but a parable for what? Now I'm gonna, a little commentary from me. We've all been studying this together. We've seen what he's writing here about Rambam referring to these stories as parables, right? And we've learned this together about how Rambam says in translating the words literally is, is, can bring up a lot of challenges. Okay, now I'm back to his words. Maimonides agrees that the story is about fear or awe of God. When the angel says, for now I know that you fear God, <clears throat> Maimonides takes it to mean, now all people will know what the limits of the fear of God are. The normal way of interpreting this is that Maimonides is saying that when it comes to the fear of God, there are no limits. In other words, most readers take him to mean that the fear of God takes precedence over everything else. So Abraham was perfectly justified in taking Isaac to the mountain with the intention of sacrificing him. Recently, the philosopher Joseph Stern has argued that if Maimonides had thought there were no limits to the fear of God, he would have said so. But the phrase, all people will know what the limits of the fear of God are, which is a translation of, from the Mor Nebuchem, right? suggests that there are limits, right? In other words, all people will know what the limits of the fear of God are, so that suggests there are limits, and it is important to be aware of them. Maimonides is highly critical of people who starve themselves, beat themselves, jeopardize their health, or inflict unnecessary pain on themselves or others in an attempt to demonstrate loyalty to God, right? In his view, and everything that God asks of us is designed to promote human welfare, not jeopardize it. So it wouldn't make sense that the Ramam is saying over here, um, this is me talking now, right? Is saying over here that there are no limits to the extent that you can sacrifice uh, your child, right? Now I'm back to his words. So to the question, quote, couldn't God ask someone to do something on a whim to test their willingness to obey, end quote? Maimonides answers with a resounding no. God does nothing whimsical or in vain. Everything God asks of us has essentially one purpose to get us to develop our ability to think and become the most perfect creatures we can be. So why then does Genesis 22 have God asking Abraham to sacrifice his son? And why having asked one thing of Abraham, does God suddenly seem to change his mind? To answer these questions, we have to turn to Maimonides' view of prophecy. Now I'm speaking now. We discussed it a little bit. We didn't get to the part where Rambam discusses prophecy in detail. We've mentioned it a few times. But uh, Ziskin here is going to give us a little summary that's going to be really nice. Now back to his words. Read, read literally, stories that say God spoke to someone, and this we have studied together, make it seem as if God produces sound waves in the air in much the same way that an announcer at a sporting event produces sound waves over the speaker system. Even if only one person is involved, as in the case of Abraham, literal interpretation has God issuing audible commands. According to Maimonides, this is nothing short of ridiculous. Prophecy is a spiritual event, not an auditory one. When the text says God spoke in his view, and we've studied this together, so you should, guys should be familiar with this. The real meaning is that the prophet came to realize what God wanted. What a prophecy is, is an, when, the, when the prophet achieves knowledge of truth, achieves knowledge of, of what God wants in this particular situation, okay? So back to his words. To understand how this happens, we should note that Maimonides divides the human mind into two faculties, reason and imagination. Reason enables us to understand truth such as the Pythagorean theorem or facts of biological reproduction. Imagination enables us to conceive of a physical thing as if it is actually present to us. For example, if you close your eyes, you can conjure up the image of the Eiffel Tower that makes it seem as if I'm standing in front of it, right? There are people with a well-developed faculty of reason, but an impoverished imagination. Think of a college professor noted for giving boring lectures. By the same token, there are people with lively imaginations, but no facility for grasping abstract truth. So think of a poet, for example, or a politician who says the first thing that comes into his mind without taking the time to think it over. 
What distinguishes the prophet is that both faculties have attained perfection. Okay, this means that the prophet can understand abstract truths, but unlike the boring college professor, can communicate them in a lively manner by picking helpful examples and employing forceful rhetoric. It is one thing to tout the virtues of world peace, another to produce the image of people beating their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. That's a beautiful sentence. Sometimes the prophet's imagination is so vivid that when he grasps an abstract truth, it is as if he can hear an external voice speaking to him. In a similar way, ancient Greek poets often said that writing poetry was like listening to a muse. Maimonides takes this to mean that even if the text has God speaking to a prophet directly, what is really happening is that the prophet is experiencing a dream or a vision in which God is the principal subject. There's nothing magical about this. Who has not had a dream in which one seemed to hear a voice, see another person, or listen to a popular song? The difference is that for most of us, these voices or images are scattered and do not result from the realization of an important truth. For the prophet, it is otherwise. The voices or images are the direct result of an intellectual awakening. Without that understanding, the prophet would have no authority to speak for God. Let us now return to Abraham. Okay. When God asks him to take Isaac to the mountain and offer him as a sacrifice, Maimonides would say that Abraham had a vision in which he came to believe that fear or awe of God had to be limitless to be legitimate. Let that sink in for a second. I'm going to read it again. Abraham had a vision in which he came to believe that fear or awe of God had to be limitless to be legitimate. In other words, he believed that a person who feared God had to be willing to go to extremes to show that his fear was authentic. So powerful was Abraham's vision that he imagined that God was actually speaking to him. That is why he rose early the next morning and set out for the land of Moriah. And now I'm speaking on my own for a moment. So, so, so imagine this is what Avraham Avinu thought, right? And he came to this incredible knowledge and awareness and vision of, of what he, he perceived to be truth, right? Because that's what Nebuah is. That's what prophecy is, according to Maimonides. At a critical moment, however, Abraham had another vision, this time imagining that God was speaking to him through an angel. Unlike the first vision where Abraham thought fear of God had no limits, he now comes to see that it does have limits. Fear of God has to do with awe and humility before God, not with the shedding of innocent human blood. In an earlier passage, Maimonides captured this kind of humility by saying that when a person compares himself to God, he will realize, and this is repeated in several places, most famously in the beginning of Hilchus Yisodiah Torah in the, in, the, in the Mishnah Torah, he will realize that he has a vessel full of shame, dishonor, and reproach, empty and deficient. This is a strange, strongly worded passage, one that probably goes beyond what most people would accept today. Yet strong as it is, the passage says nothing about willingness to sacrifice human life. On a Maimonidean reading then, if we're consistent applying Maimonides' ideas to learning this Parsha, it is not that God relents at the last minute and allows Isaac to live, but that Abraham, but rather that Abraham comes to see that the position he adopted at first cannot be correct. Letting God into your life does not mean that you have to be willing to commit ritual murder. A somewhat similar position is taken by a medrash that calls attention to the ambiguity in the original command. As we saw earlier, take your son and make him an ola, right, which is the word used in the Torah, could be interpreted as take your son and make him into a burnt offering. Or a literal interpretation of ola means literally bring him up to God. And ola generally refers to a burnt offering. The Medrash has God insisting that all he meant is the latter, not the former. Bring him up, but not actually sacrifice, right? The Medrash, uh, in fact, after making this point, God tells Avram, now you can take him back down. Granted that this is not the way the story is usually read, I mention it only because it sets a precedent for saying that Abraham's willing to sacrifice Isaac was based on a misunderstanding. So Ziskin is trying to say that just like the Medrash says it, I'm also saying this, right? The same concept that Avram Avinu's first vision was a misunderstanding. It was a mistake. To return to Maimonides, when the angel says, now I know that you fear God, the meaning would be, now I know that you fear God in the right way because you recognize what the limits of fear are. In sum, 
Abraham is an obedient servant, but his obedience is to a God who insists on the sanctity of human life rather than a God who is willing to suspend it for his own purposes. Thus, as it says in Vayikra, <coughs> you shall keep my laws and my rules by the pursuit of which man shall live, right? B'chai b'chai. In the interest of full disclosure, I should point out two things. First, Maimonides does not discuss Genesis 22, right, in this degree of detail. What I have done is to construct an interpretation of the passage consistent with the rest of his philosophy. The advantages of this interpretation are that it greatly reduces the element of horror and preserves the goodness of God. If Maimonides is right, there is no room in Judaism for fanatical behavior. Um, so I, I, he writes a little bit more. I'm going to stop there. But I, I'm going to stop here and ask if anyone wants to comment on what I just read. Go ahead. I think you're still muted. I gotta, you got to unmute yourself. Uh, I love what you say. In fact, I'm, I've been so disturbed by the thesis. Uh, I skip over it uh, and uh, into uh -huh. uh, the High Holidays uh, repetition. So for 2,000 years, our rabbis have, uh, have uh, misinterpreted this. Um, I'm just wondering, I, I love what he, he said, uh, but how do you uh, weigh that against what is the traditional, uh, 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 almost without exception, uh, um, uh, 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 construction of that story? Well, I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer your question, <laughs> but I am going to say the following. What Ziskin just did was take consistently use do exactly what the Mora Nebuchim tells us we're supposed to do with the Mora Nebuchim. Ramam tells us repeatedly, I'm not going to answer all your questions, but if you take my ideas and apply them to the Torah, you will find, or at least you'll get closer to, in many cases, finding the answers to the questions, right? So the Ramam, sa Ramam says, I can't possibly answer every Parsha in the Torah, every Chazal, Remember, he said, I started writing a book like that and I changed my mind. This was way back in the beginning. I started trying to explain every Chazal according to my principles. And the Ramah said, it's, it's crazy. It's it'd be ridiculous. It's impossible. I can't do it, right? But, um, but, but what, what Ziskin just did was take the ideas that we've studied, go back to one of the most difficult and most painful to read episodes in the Torah and made it astoundingly beautiful. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. It's just... All of a sudden, it's, it, it, it just makes sense. Like all the questions that we had, and I apologize for one second. I need to mute myself. Just give me one minute. Hold on. Just hold that. I'm really sorry about that. It was a uh, patient. I needed to take it, gotcha. but but he. But can I he, just have a follow up? Uh, go ahead, please. Uh, this is the 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 Kedis press, the most perplexing story uh, in, in the entire uh, Tanakh, at least in my yes. view. So uh, uh, I love this interpretation. Uh, Maimonides is no dummy. He's writing a book guide to the perplexed. Why does it take 800 years from the time these seeds are planted for uh, uh, Kenneth the Seaskin? Uh, to uh, cover uh, this beautiful uh, interpretation. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I can tell you that the, the Rambam's ideas have been used over and over again repeatedly by Mefarshe Tanakh of the rationalist uh, 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 persuasion to, to apply those principles. I've given examples before. Uh, take the Radak, for example, on the Tanakh. 
consistently uses Maimonide and ideas to, to unravel very perplexing stories in Tanakh. Uh, the Ralbag, you know, the Gersonides, uh, does it all the time. So these are Mepharshim who, who, who used the Maimonidean principles in order to make sense of partios and, and, and topics that are difficult. And, and here, uh, but uh, what Ziskin did, and there's a lot of work to do, you know, but if we, if we take these ideas that, you know, if, if, you're, if you're a rationalist, right? If you're not a rationalist, then you're gonna take the path of, of the more, you know, other schools of thought, that's fine. And there's other ways to legitimately understand Tanakh. But if you are a rationalist and you're trying to stick with, you know, then with the Rambam's ideas are so, so, so relevant. And, 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 and they help us learn, they help us understand, you know? So I, I wanted to use that example because when I saw it, I was so blown away that I just, I just felt like I needed to share it. Um, anyway, so let's, uh, um, let's let, so now we can go on to chapter six, okay? Thank you for sharing that. It, it was awesome. very enlightening. Yeah, thanks, you're welcome. If I find other things like that, I'll, I'll um, here, he has another book that I didn't read yet. It's Maimonides on the Origin of the World. I haven't gotten to it, read it yet, so I can't tell you, but I'm sure it's going to be a good one. <laughs> anyway, so let's go to chapter six. So now, the fact that angels exist, I'm on page 261, okay? Uh, Does that <laughs> yes? Yeah, I wanted to ask you, so basically, what you're arguing with that theory is that Avram had just an incomplete not only incomplete, he just had a defective level of appreciation of God, so defective that even a typical person today would have a much more advanced understanding. He was basically a, a heathen, a buffoon, and it was only at the end that he gained insight. But the first, all the other incidents of Abraham, where he was great, he was given the covenant, he was just a buffoon, a uh, uneducated, unlettered person. It's only here, finally, at the end of his life, in that one moment he saw the light. I don't know if, I don't know. I think that Buffoon is putting him down too much. I think he- Well, I mean, he wants to kill people. He thinks that, unlike the, the traditional reading, which says he didn't want to do it. God told him to do it, to test him. But here, he well, thought the best thing to do was to sacrifice his son. Well, the best thing to do was to obey God's will and to demonstrate how far that, that God's will has no bounds. And that's not, that's not like that thought in and of itself is 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 good. I mean, it, in most cases, it's true, right? But the and, but the Ramam says, but there are bounds, and and also, but the fact that Avraham Avinu achieves that level is very consistent with Ramam's thinking about Avraham Avinu in general, and consistent with a lot of thoughts that Avraham Avinu came up with all these ideas on his own, right? The, it, uh, that's the greatness of Avraham because he so and this the story of the Akeda was the story of Avram going through that process and coming to that realization you know um and it was really a result of the Akeda that Avram was chosen to be uh, well I mean yeah the, there were covenants beforehand but but um but I, I don't know if I would use the there term multiple before. covenants multi well yeah, yeah what else do you call a person who wants to kill their child He was mistaken. He thought, I mean, people in those days, that was pretty standard stuff for gods, right? No, they didn't. That's, right. people so that's that, what you're saying, that he was, he had this mistaken belief, what, consistent with the pretty you know, but, smart people like we are today. I'm just saying. Well, that it's you, not that we're smart, but we're post-Abraham. So we've now learned that lesson. You know, we know that there are yeah. limits. You know, yeah. had we been around back then, we would have been sacrificing our kids too. You know, I'm not convinced that the Rambam would say this, that even though he says in general that that there would be dreams, doesn't mean in every case that this is the, the way to apply it. All right. Well, I mean, we could, uh, we'll, we'll, um, we'll, we, you know, I, I, we'll explore it, further. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. We have a lot more, a lot more of the guide to go through, but, um, Let's, so we're about to do in six, we're about to do uh, the angels. So the fact that angels exist does not require that a proof deriving from the, when he says the law, I'm going to translate the Torah because I just like that better, be brought forward. Um, in other words, the fact that there's such a thing as angels, it's all over the Torah, it's there. So I, I don't need to discuss with you whether they exist, but, but what are they? That's what we're about to talk about. For the Torah has stated this in a number of passages. 
Now you should know that the term Elohim, and I said that purposely with the hey, is a term applied to judges, right? Very often, so, so when it uses the word Elohim in the Torah, there are many places where it's clearly uh, referring to a court, to judges, right? And it's not referring to a God at all, or not even anything uh, God-like, right? Thus, the cause of both parties, you know, parties shall come before uh, uh, Elohim. That's the verse that uh, that's the most famous one. For this reason, the word is applied figuratively to the angels and to the deity because of his being a judge of the angels, right? So hence it says, for the Lord, your Elohim, right? This being addressed to the whole of mankind. So God is referred to as Elohim as a reference to the fact that he is a judge over us. That's that's the the... The meaning of that term when it's used in reference to God is referring to that aspect of God. Um, he is the Elohim of the Elohim, which means the deity of the angels and the Lord of lords. That is master of the spheres and the stars. Okay. So remember, Rama just explained to us before what the spheres and stars are, which are the lords of everybody other than themselves. Those spheres and stars are like the lords over all of us. Because remember, that's how nature works. There's the outer sphere, the inner sphere, and inner sphere, and so on and so forth, like we explained. Um, this is the meaning of the verse and not that the Elohim and the Lord belong to the human species for they are too lowly for that. This is so particularly in view of the fact that the dictum, your Elohim, includes the whole human species as rulers as well as the rule. Nor can the meaning be either that he, may he be exalted, is the master of everything that is believed to be divine, even if it is fashioned of stone and wood. For there is no glorification and no magnification and the affirmation that the deity is the master of stone, timber, and a piece of cast metal, right? So when it says that God is the Elohim over us, right, what is meant is that he is the judge of the judges, I mean to say of the angels, and the master of the spheres. So God controls the spheres. And that's a, a way of ascri ascribing greatness to God, describing his, you know. Now, a chapter making it clear to us that angels are not bodies occurs previously in this treatise. I already described to you that just as God is not corporeal, angels are also not corporeal. Okay, we, we, we studied that together uh, about a couple months back. This is also what Aristotle says, but there's a difference in the terms, for he speaks of separate intellects and we speak of angels. So he just... Uh, said that that which Aristotle refers to as these intellects that make the spheres move, we call them angels. He's going to make that more clear in a second. As for his saying that these separate intellects are also intermediaries between God, may be exalted, and the existence, and that it is through their intermediation that the spheres are in motion, which motion is the cause of the generation of the things subject to generation. Remember, it's the motion of those spheres that causes things on this world to come to be into existence and, and to stop existing and so on and so forth. This too is the textual teaching of all the books. That's how it works that angels are the intermediaries of God. Remember, he's identifying angels with the Aristotelian forces that make the world go round, that make the spheres go round. This is the crucial point that Ramam is making here. That when we call things angels, we're referring to those intellects that we learned about in our science lecture. Okay. Now you already know that the meaning of an angel is a messenger. The word malach in Hebrew, it, it, it literal translation is a messenger. And there's many places in the Torah where it's used in that context, referring to a messenger, not a heavenly angel, right? Accordingly, everyone who carries out an order is a malach, is an angel. So that the movements of animals, even when these beings are not rational, are stated in the text of the scripture to have been accomplished through an angel. So when, when, when we read about Madrasim that tell us that there are angels that make things move, what it's referring to is very simple. It's referring to the, the, the force within that animal that, that makes that animal go, right? So an animal has a mind at whatever level it has, and it decides to do something, right? That's an angel making it go, okay? The same way as everything that happens in this world happens through some sort of angel which according to Rambam is a scientifically measurable real phenomenon. It's an actual thing, right? If the motion was produced in accordance with the intention of the deity who put a force in the living being that moved him according to that motion, right? Because God decided to create the world in such a way that there should be forces that make things happen in the world in such and such a way. 
So those are therefore, those angels, those forces that we encounter in this world are therefore angels of God, okay? Thus it says, my God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouths and they have not hurt me, right? That's in Daniel after the lions did not eat him, right? Because the, the and when Daniel said that God sent angels, <clears throat> according to Ramam, it doesn't mean angels. It means the lion decided to close his mouth and not eat me, right? The movements of Bilam's donkey are all of them brought about through an angel, right? Even the elements are in their turn called angels. Thus, who makest winds his angels, the flaming fire his ministers. This got Ramam bringing proofs from the psukim that the winds, the, for, the forces of nature are angels, right? It will be explained to you that an angel is said of a messenger from among men. Thus, and Yaakov sent angels. It is said of the prophet, and the angel of the Lord came from Gilgal to Bochim, and he sent an angel and brought us forth from Egypt. It is furthermore said of the separate intellects, separate intellects, that's the Aristotelian term for the forces that make the spheres move, right? That appear to the prophets in the vision of prophecy. In addition, it is said of the animal forces, which we shall explain later on. He's going to get more into that, what he said about animals and angels later. Now, our discourse here shall only deal with the angels who are separate intellects. Right now, I'm only going to talk about those for our law does not deny the fact that he meaning God with the capital H right may be exalted governs that which exists here through the intermediation of the angels. That's how God made this world happen by making the outer sphere, then the inner sphere and so on and so forth through those through those spheres. Thus, there is the text of the sages with reference to the dictum of the Torah. Let us make man in our image and it's going to come. Let us go down. Right. So God that those are proofs from the Torah that God um, runs the world, so to speak, through these forces of nature. OK, which are angels, which are these separate intellects, which that's the Aristotelian term for the forces of nature. They said the Holy One, blessed be, as it were, does nothing without contemplating the the, Pama, the upper Pamalia. This is um, uh, that's just a quote from Chazal. Marvel at their saying contemplating. They specifically use the term for an intellectual, an intellectual idea, right? For Plato uses literally the same expression at that Chazal did. Here we have Ramam comparing Plato to Chazal, right? Saying that God looks at the world of the intellects. So in other words, it's through these intellects, intellects being the forces of nature. And I'm sorry, I have to take this call again. Please give me a second. Sorry about that. I apologize. But um, so again, then he brings a whole bunch of quotes and you could see the Holy One Blessed does nothing without consulting the Pamaya. The Pamaya means the, an army in Greek. In Bracious Rabbah and Medrash Kohelis, it is likewise said what they have already made. It is not said he has made, but they have made. He, as it were, and his tribunal have decided regarding each of your limbs uh, um, and have put it in its position. For it said, he hath made the unestablished. In other words, what does it mean he works through his pamalia, through his angels? It means God works through forces of nature. Okay? Remember, when Ramam says that God is uh, controls those intellects, right? What, what he's saying in, in, in the closest modern terminology we can use is God works through forces of nature. Uh, whenever it is said, and the Lord, he and his tribunal are meant. Okay? In all these texts, the intention is not, as is thought by the ignorant, to assert that there is a speech on the part of God, may be exalted. And this, it touches a little bit on the Ziskin that I read to you guys, where, where the Rambam it categorically says that, the, that, think of the idea that God speaks in any way, shape, or form like we think of it. It's just not, it's just, that's just not how it works, Right or deliberation, or sight, or consultation, or recourse for help to the opinion of someone. It's not like God is speaking and having a conversation with somebody. For how could the creator seek help from that which he has created? It just doesn't make any logical sense, right? Whatever it is that God would, in theory, be speaking to is something that God made, right? Rather, do all these texts state plainly that all this, including the various parts of that which exists, 
and even the creation of the limbs of animals as they are have been brought about through the intermediation of angels for all forces. Those are all forces. And I'm going to put in parentheses of nature are angels. How great is the blindness of ignorance and how harmful. If you told a man who is one of those who deem themselves to be as the sages of Israel, that the deity sends an angel who enters the womb of a woman and forms the fetus there. He would be pleased with this assertion and would accept it and would regard it as a manifestation of greatness and power on the part of the deity and also of his wisdom may be exalted. Nevertheless, he would also believe at the same time that the angel is a body formed of a burning fire and that his size is equal to that of a third part of the whole world. He would regard all this as possible with respect to God. The Ramah is poking fun at people that imagined angels as fiery beings. An angel comes flowing, flying down and goes into the womb and makes a baby, right? But if you tell him that God has placed in the sperm, right? But if you tell him the scientific fact, and here Ramam is going to tell us the scientific understanding of embryology, that in the sperm, there's a formative force shaping the limbs and giving them their configuration and that this force is an angel, right? But if you tell him that, no, what happens is science. What happens is, the sperm makes a baby, right? Obviously, the Ramam didn't know about the sperm and the egg and all that. But just imagine it, if, if you'd be talking today. If you tell a guy, instead of telling him about a fiery angel that, and, that's coming or flying around and running into women's wombs, right? right? Instead, you tell him that, no, what happens is a sperm meets an egg and the, then the DNA starts to replicate. The cells start to separate and so on and so forth. Or that all the forms derive from the act of the active intellect. And that the latter is the angel and that that itself, right? The unity of the sperm and the egg and, and the way we know in modern science or in his day, the sperm developing into a baby, that is the angel. If you tell him that, right? And the prince of the world constantly mentioned by the sages, the man would shrink from the spin. And he'll tell you, what kind of a, a terrible heretic are you, right? <laughs> what do you mean? That's not an angel. That's in the science book. An angel is a, is an angel, is some holy thing, whatever. No. So, so, for, so um, Dharam was trying to be extremely clear with what he's trying to tell us here. For he does not understand the notion of the true greatness and power that consists. It's so much greater to, to, to explain the, the forces of science, the forces of how the world actually works. That consists in the bringing into existence of forces active in a thing. Forces that cannot be apprehended by any sense. We can't imagine the amount of forces and how things interact and how things are created and how things come to be. They're spectacular on their own without resorting to flying angels, right? The sages, may their memory be blessed, have stated explicitly for the benefit of him who is a sage that every force appertaining to the bodily forces is an angel. Every force that happens to us in our bodies, the force that makes our hands move, that is what's called an angel. All the more, the forces distributed in the world, everything that makes you know, airplanes fly and, and trees blow in the wind, those are angels. That every force has one particular activity proper to it and not two activities. So because that's 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 our Sicilian idea that that the that the um the intellect of whichever thing that's moving tells it to move do that one particular thing that it that it does. That the, the, the unity of forces is a very modern idea. The idea that it will boil it all down to one force is, is a modern scientific idea, right? For it is said in Bereshit Sarabha, it has been learned one angel does not perform two missions, nor do two angels perform one mission. Now, this is the characteristic of all forces, a circumstance that should confirm in your opinion the assertion that individual natural and psychic forces are called angels, that individual natural and psychic meaning in your mind, forces, are what is called angels, is their dictum figuring in a number of passages driving from Bereshit Rabba. And here the Raman says, every day, the Holy One, blessed be he, creates a group of angels. They sing before him and go away. Okay, what does this mean? Give the Raman a chance to explain it. When this dictum was criticized by recourse to another dictum, indicating that the angels are permanent, and in fact, it has been explained several times that the angels are living and existing permanently, the answer is given that some are permanent and others are liable to perish. And such is the truth of the matter. For the individual forces are constantly generated and corrupted, whereas the species to which these forces belong are permanent and do not become defective. In other words, right? The, the forces of nature themselves are always constant. Those forces are the same, right? right? In his case, the intellect that makes each sphere go around, that's a force of nature. That's constant. Now, the result of all of those forces getting together and making something happen, right, 
that is temporary because some things grow. A person is born, uh, you know, lives, and then the person passes on and is gone. So whatever force makes Saul Weinreb go one day, you know, hopefully many, many, many years from now won't be anymore, right? But the overall force that causes human beings to become existent, that is permanent. And the source referred to it is said with the reference to the story of Yehuda and Tamar. Rabbi Yochran said, Yehuda wanted to pass by, but the Holy One, blessed be he, caused the angel put in charge of lust, right? So in other words, Yehuda didn't want to see a prostitute, right? He was walking down the road and he saw a prostitute, but his natural uh, inclination, his first inclination was to do the right thing and walk past her, right? However, the, 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 the angel in charge of lust, meaning the force of orgasm, in other words, the pleasure of sex, right, uh, caused to present himself to him, right? So that force, the desire for, for the sexual desire is an angel, okay? This force too is called by him an angel. Rabbi Yochanan calls that a malach, right? It's a natural thing that humans have, and it's a malach. Here you have another proof, Ramam says, from, from Chazal, that I'm right, that natural forces are angels, okay? And thus you will find that they constantly speak of an angel put in charge of this or that. When we read in Chazal about there's an angel in heaven that's in charge of, uh, of, of storms and there's an angel that's in charge of, of, I don't know, earthquakes. And what it means is the natural force that causes earthquakes to happen is an angel. The natural force that causes storms to happen is an angel. That's what it means when it says there's an angel in charge. Okay, for every force charged by God may be exalted with some business is an angel put in charge of that being. Accordingly, he brings Medrash Kohelas. When man sleeps, his soul speaks to the angel and the angel to the, to, the, to the cherub, to the cherub. Thereby they have stated plainly to him who understands and cognizes intellectually that the imaginative faculty, that, 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 that ability of us, remember, as can referred to, the Ramam divides our brain into two functions, the imaginative faculty and the intellectual faculty, right? The one that cognizes and recognizes things and the one that imagines things. That faculty that we have in our mind is likewise called an angel on the top of page 265. And the, the intellect, which is the other part of the brain, which again, Ziskin was referring to in, in what I quoted before, is called a cherub, in, at least in specifically that Medrash Kohelis that he's quoting. How beautiful must this appear to him who knows and how distasteful to the ignorant. The Ramam understands what he's up against. He realizes what the non-rationalists think of when they think of angels. And he's saying how beautiful it is if you stick with what I'm trying to tell you and stick with the rationalist approach, okay? Um, we have, so, uh, so if anyone try, thinks that the, the Rambam's approach takes the beauty and power and awe and majesty away by trying to make everything rational and scientific sounding, what Rambam is trying to tell us is that it's just the opposite. If you take my approach, it's so much more amazing when you look at how a human being develops from a sperm and an egg and all the incredible things that have to happen for all that to work, which are scientific, which we can see under a microscope. It's way more amazing than trying to say some story about an angel flying around. Okay, it's, and that's Ram is saying, how beautiful must this appear to him who knows and how distasteful to the ignorant. Although people that are ignorant of this, the Ramam is saying, unfortunately, find what I'm saying to be distasteful. And the Ramam recognizes that very well. We have already spoken of the fact that every form in which an angel is seen exists in the vision of prophecy. And here we're going we're gonna to jump to that vision of prophecy, that idea. You will find that there are prophets who see the angels as if they were human individuals. Remember, when we're going to get to that point, right, where which Ziskin was touching on in the in the chapter that I read to you, that a prophecy is what's happening in the imaginative faculty of a person who has reached an, in such an incredible level of intellect, right? Where their imaginatory their, um, uh, um, for power and their intellectual power are, are, are both completely honed and united, right? And they will imagine, they will see angels in these visions as if they were human beings. Thus it is said, and lo, three men, so this is the Rambam specifically. The Ramban famously attacks this Rambam because the Rambam explains the three angels that visit Avram Avinu. And right here is one of those places where he says it straight up. He's quoting, that he's saying that those three men that Avram Avinu saw that visited him, 
were visions in his mind. And that's what it means by see that he saw angels, but he saw angels in the form of men. Others from among them see an angel as if he were a man causing terror and amazement, right? Thus it is said, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible. In other words, other prophets, when they see an angel, they see something angry and frightening and, 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 and scary. And he brings a quote from, from uh, Shoftim, and I don't remember what that quote is. Uh, I, I don't have the Hebrew kapach open in front of me. If someone can quickly pull up a, 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 a Shoftim, you'd give him a pasuk vav. I'll tell us which, 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 uh, who's he referring to. Again, others from among us see an angel as fire. Thus, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in the heart of fire. Wasn't Shoftim right? yud gimel vav Samson when the angel visits the mother of Samson? That's uh, uh, that sounds like it's probably right. I'm sorry, I'm, I can pull it up. Give me a second. She visits Ashes Manoach. Um, yeah, that is where it is. Yes, so it's. I'll read it in Hebrew in a second. Uh, so this is the 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 Manoach's wife saying the vision that she saw. She tells her husband Lamar, Isha Elohim ba Eli. So she saw him as a fearsome, frightening figure, right? Um, okay, so yeah, thank you. So, so, so there you have a, a, a vision of a prophecy. This woman was on, she was actually a prophet or not, but close enough to prophecy to see an angel and have this vision, right? And she describes it that way, whereas Avram Avinu perceived three, three men, right? Um, and thus, and, uh, and so on. And he brings other examples where people visualize angels with different images. Idea being that the angel is, is, is a product of the imaginary faculty of the prophet. The prophet is seeing the angel in a certain way for, the, for, for a reason. Um, uh, however, the discussion of prophecy will occur later on when it's proper. I'm emphasizing again, even though Ramam numerous times back and forth it gives us tastes of what his idea of prophecy are. He's going to deal with the ideas of prophecy in detail. And, and um, however, the discuss so I mean, we'll talk about it later. He's going to talk about how prophecy works, but I, we've touched on it enough times that we're getting an idea of how he looks at prophecy. There it is further said, before they accomplish their mission, they are called men. When they have accomplished it, they are endued with, imbued with, uh, or endowed, I don't know what that word is supposed to be, with the angelic state. Consider how clear it is in every respect that the notion of an angel is that of a certain act and that every vision of an angel occurs only in a vision of prophecy and according to the state of him who apprehends. The Ramam states clearly as day on black and white that the only whenever someone sees an angel, it's always in a vision. It's never real. I, let that sink in for a minute. There is then nothing in what Aristotle, for his part, has said about this subject that is not in agreement with the Torah, right? Aristotle just used a different term, right? Um, so whatever he explained with the world scientifically, however, a point on which he disagrees with us, where does Aristotle disagree, is in all this. It's constituted by his belief that all these things are eternal and they proceed necessarily from him, that it's, all, it's always been this way and always will be. For we ourselves believe that all this has been created and that God has created the separate intellect. So all these angels and so on are things that God created and has put in the sphere the force of desire toward them. And that it was he who created the intellects and the spheres and put in them the governing forces. As to this, we do disagree with him. Later on, you shall hear his opinion and the opinion of the true uh, Torah regarding the world's having produced in time. I will discuss that about how I believe that the world was created. So I am going to stop here for the day. And um, I think today was an extraordinarily powerful one. If, uh, um, so if you let, let it sink into your minds and then ask me any questions if you have any <laughs> or comments or observations. I have a question. Um, sure. Uh, is there any difference between an angel in, in Maimonides' term thinking and what we would call a cause uh, in, um, in modern so, language. So, so, so it's the, I'm glad you asked that because I, I wanted to finish with, with 
what's really the answer to that question. Obviously, we don't think of intelligences anymore when we learn science, right? Uh, that make the world move. We think in, in a completely different way, right? But if you, if you, um, if you try to take the Maimonidean uh, paradigm of how he conceives of angels as forces of nature, right? Then nowadays you would probably have, you know, like, and I say with the caveat that I've said a million times that whenever I say what the Rambam would have said, it's conjecture. It's what I assume. I mean, I think I'm right, but who knows, right? There's no way to know for sure, right? But the, but the point being that I'm pretty convinced that had the Rambam been alive today, you know, right? Famous what if, he would have looked at the world and learned science the way you and I studied in, in high school and college or whatever. And he would have said that the angels are the forces of nature that make things move, right? However, we determine forces of nature today, right? So, so um, later on, we'll find where he says that, you know, demons and things like that, those are illnesses, right? So nowadays, we know that they're caused by bacteria, they're caused by viruses, they're caused by prions, whatever we're learning today about what's causing diseases or what's causing, you know, all the bad forces of nature, you know, they're simply natural phenomena, natural things. And, and God runs the world through natural phenomena. This is the crucial thing. There is no spiritual um, forces, mysterious forces that make things happen in this world. The world works through science. The world works through the way God made this world work. And it, it's, it's an radically different, a radically different understanding of the world than many other thinkers in Judaism. And this is, this is a lot of, of what made this book so controversial. You know, when the Rambam said this, um, it, you know, it, it, a lot of people got, were really blown away by this. Anyway, does that kind of answer your question? Yes, but I have another one. I mean, and, and all the references to angels in the um, in the Torah or in the Tanakh are manifestations of individuals, um, individual minds. Uh, uh, I mean, basically every single story in Tanakh, according to the Rambam, where there's communication between a human and something that's presented as divine. Right, every single one of those cases, according to Rama, and he just said it, black on white. I read it. I'm not making this up. Right, right, <laughs> right. Is a vision. Mm -hmm. Is 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 the product of the mind of the person, right, who is having that vision. Now, what's happening? He's going to go into more detail when he talks about prophecy in detail. But the basic idea is is that person has such a incredibly honed. Uh, an incredibly well-educated and well-developed uh, sense of, of, of truth and sense of, of intellect and sense of imagination that the person is able to, to combine the truth, the scientific truths that he or she has conceived and combine that with an imagination that presents an image that conveys that truth, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about Yeshayahu, right? talking about the, the image that Ziskin brought to beat their swords into plowshares, right? Imagine a man in the time of Ishayahu, in the time of tremendous amount of strife, uh, the, the building, the Assyrian empire was conquering all over the Middle East. And a lot of, tons of, a lot of stuff going on, right? And I, Isaiah was able to envision world peace, right? Like, intellectually, he was able to comprehend that the, the place where we need to bring this world just to a place where people get along. And in his mind, the idea, the intellectual idea of world peace had formed an image of people beating their swords into plowshares. Hence, you know, when, the, when they build the United Nations, that image is so lasting and so ingrained in, in humanity that, that we can't get it out of our heads. When we think about peace, we think about that verse in Isaiah. Everyone and almost on the entire planet because that it's, it's such a powerful image that and that's what a prophet is that's what the Ramam just explained thank you oh you're welcome if i'm getting worked up I, I, it's because i am this is just absolutely astoundingly beautiful stuff mm -hmm. so um but uh i'm glad you everyone enjoyed and looking forward to next week have a wonderful evening all right thank you welcome. thank you